Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my thesis um, is one of those ones that uh, Bertrand glossed over very quickly uh, in his talk. So I'm going to elaborate on a couple of his points um, and also probably touch on a couple of the questions that people asked earlier about uh, as part of this process, going around talking to farmers, it's a very common complaint that you hear that you know, one batch of turning up in places that have never been seen before. We haven't seen them yet for 30 or 40, 50 years, whatever. But that doesn't necessarily mean that wombats shouldn't be there or that they haven't been there in the past, just that people haven't seen them recently. And part of this process will explain some of these things to you. So we talk about, um, we wanted to find out where wombats were at the time of European settlement and how that distribution has changed over time. Uh, as part of that, we're going to look at a couple of examples which elaborate on it to, to show some of the causalities about why things have changed and then talk about how what implications that might have for wombats today and in the future. Now anybody who knows anything about hairy nose wombats will know that their distribution is highly fragmented. Uh, southern hairy nose wombats are mainly con uh, constricted to five major geographic areas, although there is a, a, uh, a translated colony on, Spen on um, Wedge Island in Spencer Gulf. Um, northern hairy nose wombats, one remnant colony in Epping Forest in central Queensland, although they have recently established a translocated colony in St George in southern Queensland in part of their former range. Now we also know that there used to be a large colony of northern hairy nosed wombats uh, in the New South Wales Riverina. It's often referred to as the Nilican wombats, but uh, more properly they should be called Drillbury wombats, and I'll explain more about that shortly as well. And that's led many people to surmise that the distribution of both species may have been contiguous at the time of European settlement. And it's not hard to find maps like this on the internet. This one is actually from the Queensland Department of Environment and Heritage website. But is it right? Um, because if it's not, and we make decisions based upon this, then we could, some of our management issues may actually be counterproductive. So we wanted to test whether this was right. So we trawled through literally thousands and thousands of documents, newspaper articles, the journals and maps of the early explorers, government reports, etc., to find out any mention of wombats to try and plot their likely distribution at the time of European settlement. And what we found was actually somewhat surprising, because rather than look like that, the distribution probably looked something like that. There were two, two groups of southern hairiness wombats, separated by Spencer Gulf, this one going across into about Balladonia in Western Australia, and the eastern population covering the Adelaide Plains, extending along the northern banks of the Murray River to around Euston in New South Wales. There was a large population in the, in the New South Wales Riverina, um, and rather than consider the Queensland population as two separate colonies, they probably should have been thought of a, a fairly geographically large but highly patchy single population group. Now, but how did we get from that to where we are today? Well, for the first 35 years or so, not much happened, apart from the Adelaide area being cleared of wombats as the new colony formed. But really, the next 50 years were absolutely catastrophic for wombats. The southern population contracted to only a core area on the far west coast of, New of uh, South Australia and a few remnant populations on the Air Peninsula and the Gore Ranges and the eastern population contracted to a very small area in the Murray Lands and a few scattered colonies on York Peninsula and the Mid-North. The Riverina population disappeared completely and the Queensland population contracted to only a few scattered colonies remained. Fortunately though, over the next second half of the 20th century, the southern hairy nose population recovered and this is as of about 1990-ish and I know it has continued to expand for example, I was out in uh, Western Australia around recently and the population is extending probably to about Cocklebiddy uh, with scattered colonies perhaps almost as far as Belladonia or some areas. Uh, we haven't been out to the lower ranges recently but we are planning on going out there fairly shortly but we know the population in that area is expanding as well. Um, however, whilst the southern area of the population has uh, recovered, the northern area of the population continued to contract so it's only about 70 odd individuals left at Epping Forest, but they have been undergoing a recovery of late. So how did this happen? Well for that we're going to turn to the New South Wales Riverina, where newspaper reports, maps etc. put the population 
quite large. Now, there was a core population around, centred around Gerildery, about 50 kilometres by about 30 kilometres just there, uh, even though they're often described as Nordwin, this is probably more accurate described from around Gerildery. But there were satellite populations along the river and as far west as Wakul, about 70 kilometres west of the Nordwin. And they probably numbered in the tens of thousands, if not more. However, by the turn of the century, they had all disappeared. Uh, and the reason for that can be summed up in this newspaper um, article from 1893. And I'll just let you read that. Indeed, so effective was this war on wombats that they went from a population that numbered in the tens of thousands to being likely extinct in about 15 years. The wombats in Riverina have often been described as going extinct because of competition from rabbits and opening the area for agriculture. But there's absolutely no doubt the evidence suggests that the reason these animals went extinct is because we deliberately exterminated them. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. And on that rather sobering note, I'll turn to the Air Peninsula, where the population is generally restricted to an area on remnant grazing land here on the Midwest coast, with a few scattered populations up here around Pichera and closer to the Gaul Ranges. But from the 19th century, there are reports of wombats from all over the southern half of the, the peninsula, from Port Lincoln to Cowes, up to Streaky Bay and all over the interior. But none, interestingly, none whatsoever from the areas around Whaler, Port Augusta and that part of the peninsula at all. And the reason for that is probably related to vegetation in the area. Now this is obviously a modern satellite image and it relates to modern vegetation, but as you can see there's quite a distinct vegetation change around this area. Obviously this is agriculture areas, but this area to the north doesn't suit wombats at all and we have no reports of wombats from this area at all, which suggests there were no linkages between the wombats on the west and eastern sides of Spencer Gulf. And you ask, how can that be? How can a single species be split like that? And to answer that question, we need to go back in time, back to the end of the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, when the sea levels were much lower and the coastline extended out here. Kangaroo Island was part of the mainland and Spencer Gulf was a broad river valley, which obviously would allow connections between the two populations. However, at that time as well, you look at the um, fossil record and wombats were much more widely spread over the interior of the continent and they're also on Kangaroo Island as little as 11,000 years ago, which is about when the island split from the mainland finally. This suggests that as the temperature rose and the vegetation changed and the interior became more arid, that wombats were pushed out and the, their ranges contracted towards the coastline and as a consequence of that, rising sea levels and increasing aridity in the interior, the range of both species was pushed away and contracted until only those core areas remained. Now, what does all this mean? It's all a very fantastic intellectual exercise working in these things out, but what does it mean for wombat conservation today? Well, the first thing, of course, rabbits. There is nothing more harmful to wombats than rabbits apart from humans and how we control rabbits. And there is an extremely strong inverse correlation between rabbit numbers and wombat numbers. Rab wombat numbers went down when rabbits arose, 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 came to an area, and as we started to control rabbits properly with myxomatosis and Khaleesi virus, the wombat numbers have been increasing. Earlier methods of controlling rabbits, such as fumigating and wand ripping, absolutely destroyed wombats in that area. In the long term, however, it does suggest that wombats are quite sensitive to climate change, and this is built on something that, that Bertram said earlier. Um, and if you were here this morning and you saw some of the lectures on um, climate change predictions for South Australia, higher temperatures, increased drought frequency, uh, and changes to the vegetation which result from that are unlikely to favour hairy nosed wombats. And as a result, their ranges right now 
are pushed up against the stops on the southern coast, where can they go? We have to start thinking about what we might have to do about wombat conservation in the future and have to start thinking about these things now because the future is now for wombats. That's, and that's all I have to say. Nice little interesting uh, quote there from uh, some of my historical research to show that we, back in those days we didn't quite get it right either. Hopefully we are getting it better today. Any questions? I'm happy to take them now. What do rabbits do to wombats? Yeah. It's, there's competition. They do they do inhabit their burrows. Um, uh, in fact, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that rabbits wouldn't have ex um, um, spread so quickly across into Western Australia, apart from wombats. Uh, the rabbits, while they are a digging animal, are not very well adapted to digging, uh, and in harder soils uh, on the, on the number of pines and things like that, uh, rabbits basically manage to spread quickly because wombats made nice neat holes for them. And that's why uh, in places like the uh, Riverina, and indeed in still many places today, 